Chancellor, Madam Secretary, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this celebration of women and celebration of scholarship. This event was initially conceived to mark the centenary of the admission of women to Oxford in 1920. It has been delayed twice because of the pandemic, but that has only served to strengthen our determination to come together. We chose to mark the anniversary by establishing the chair in women's history and chose to name the chair after one of the most extraordinary women of modern times, Hillary Rodham Clinton. The first incumbent of that chair is Professor Brenda Stevenson, who gave her riveting inaugural lecture last evening. While Oxford has always been, at the, has not always been, at the forefront of women's rights, <laughs> we have been at the forefront of educating extraordinary women. For 40 years prior to their formal admission at the university, women studied at the margins took examinations and qualified for degrees in everything but name. Extraordinary women like Cornelia Sarabchi, who studied at Somerville and became the first woman to study for a BCL and the first female reader ever admitted to the All Souls Library. She was the first woman to qualify to practice law in both India and England, though it took over 20 years for her to be admitted to the bar to do so. In a three-year period, 1904 to 1907, when my alma mater, Trinity College Dublin, admitted women and, as always, recognized Oxbridge qualifications, 700 women who studied at Oxford and Cambridge traveled by steamboat to Dublin to be awarded the degree they had earned here. They were known as the steamboat ladies. More recently, in 1970, the first Women's Liberation Conference was held at Ruskin. Three years later, Shelia Rogotham, who is here this evening, wrote her Hidden from History, 300 Years of Women's Oppression. This book was prompted by her experience studying for a degree in history at Oxford and her frustration that women were never mentioned. Even in the annals of academia, extraordinary women were all too often forgotten. Women like Europe's first female professor, Laura Bassi. In 1732, she was appointed professor of physics at the University of Bologna at the age of 21. She went on to international acclaim for her experimental work on electricity, becoming her university's highest earning academic and an influential political figure in 18th century Italy. She also gave birth to 10 children in the course of her stellar career. While extraordinary, she was not alone. Her contemporary, Maria Agnesi, an Italian mathematician, philosopher, theologian, and humanitarian, she was the first woman to write a maths handbook and the first woman to be appointed a maths professor. She was the eldest of 21 children and at the age of nine, published a Latin discourse in defense of higher education for women. She spent all her money on charitable causes and died in poverty in a poorhouse of which she'd been the founder. Through the establishment of this chair, we want to reclaim women's history. And not just the history of public figures or noted academics, but the history of so many women who have held families, economies, cultures, and societies together throughout the ages so that they are no longer hidden. As we celebrate and reclaim our past, we are also looking to the future. So I'd now like to turn to our panel of distinguished historians who are going to explore the future of women's history and how it will speak to generations to come. Professor Ruth Harris is going to moderate the panel. She is Senior Research Fellow at All Souls and Professor of Modern History here at Oxford. She won the Wilson Prize for her extraordinary book on Dreyfus and has written widely on topics in the history of religion, gender, healing, and science. Professor Brenda Stevenson is the Hillary Rodham Clinton Chair of Women's History. A social historian, her work centers on gender, race, family, and social conflict in America and the Atlantic world from the colonial period through the late 20th century. Laura Doan is Professor of Cultural History and Sexuality Studies at Manchester. 
Her books include Disturbing Practices, History, Sexuality, and Women's Experience of Modern War, and Fashioning Sapphism, The Origins of a Modern English Lesbian Culture. Jane Humphreys is Emeritus Professor and Fellow of All Souls and St. Helium Professor at the LSE. In over 150 scholarly publications, she has argued that women and their economic activities must be included in socioeconomic analysis, not just to make accounts complete, but to make them correct. Olivetta Otelli is Professor of the History of Slavery and Memory of Enslavement at Bristol. She works on colonial and post-colonial history, memory, politics, women, and the practices of the, and the histories of people of African descent. And finally, Linda Roper, Regis Professor of History, author of the best-selling biography of Luther, who, unlike Lindel, um, was not renowned for his feminism. In, in 2016, she was awarded the Gerder Henkel Prize for Lifetime Achievement in Historical Scholarship. So please welcome our wonderful panel. May I thank you all for being here and joining in this joyous and important occasion. I'd like to remind the audience in person and everybody else online that they can submit a question to the panel. All you need is an internet-enabled device, and then you need to go to www.slido.com. They've entered a very, very easy participant code, which is women's history, all one word, lowercase. And all then you have to do is submit your question. And through the miracle of modern technology, some of them will appear on my iPad. <laughs> so now we're going to begin by asking the panelists just to respond to this question. Where should women's history go in the next 30 years? And we'll begin with Professor Brenda Stevenson. Well, where should women's history go for the next 30 years? Everywhere. <laughs> um, so. We cannot indulge in our own grand narrative of progress. We came, we saw, we conquered the academy. We elevated girls and women everywhere. We have more to do and some to redo or to at least re revise. The movements towards global or even national and broad cultural historical narratives that either center women or fundamentally integrate the female experience and perspective, and not just as agents of progress or good, we can do other things too, um, uh, has been deeply uneven. Reducing that unevenness or inequality, we will have to, number one, first address as imperative the dearth of archival sources, research monographs, history surveys, and trade books that tell, contextualize, and advance the diverse stories and experiences of girls and women typically marginalized in societal, intellectual, and methodological hierarchies by class, race, nationality, and native or indigenous status disability, sexual orientation, religion, language, cohort size, and community geography. Number two, we should com comprehensively, not just piecemeal, extend, complicate, and even contest what we believe we know about the history of the female, the body, intellect, psychology, art and aesthetic, moral and philosophy. Number three, we have to continue to elevate or to evaluate and reevaluate what we believe we understand of the relationship of the female and the feminine to major organizational systems such as kinship, law, religion, economy, science, ecology, and education. Number four, we must employ more fully methodologies inclusive of interdisciplinarity, comparisons, oral history textual and material cultural analyses, science and psychohistory. Number five, 
commit intellectually and politically to a full reconstruction of the grand narratives of our societies, some of which has already earnestly begun, locally, nationally, and globally. Number six, design and support initiatives for women's history to, um, to be undertaken by more diverse scholars, to be more substantially supported by our academic institutions, and to be available for wider sectors of our global society to digest. Number seven, encourage and reward scholars who participate in public history and art plan platforms, along with those of us who can be resources in the efforts to build a more equitable society, especially a gender equity globe. And last, and perhaps most importantly, we must insist that the knowledge that we create be applied in our societies, at home, in the workplace, on athletic fields, and in the arts, at our institutions of learning, in the, low, uh, in the law, and the media. We must be part and parcel of the solution to our inequality, invisibility, and abuse. Thank you. Laura Doan. Well, on the day I received Lyndall's invitation to this round table, another email turned up in my inbox. Although this second email simply announced the dates of an online British history conference, I noticed underneath the signature, the organization's president had flagged her preferred pronouns. As a historian of sexuality, I couldn't help but think that the opportunity to imagine what might be in store over the next several decades for historians of women was not unrelated to this important cultural shift since pronoun usage has rapidly become a way to show respect to the trans community. From the vantage point of some trans people, the very name of the field, women's history, highlights ongoing debates about the meaning of the word woman and how our definitions relate to questions about gender inclusivity uh, and, and uh, neutrality, gender neutrality. Recently, these debates have played out in ways that have proven unproductive, with the media presenting the political interests of two groups in particular, gender critical feminists and trans activists, as not only divergent, but at loggerheads. So over the next few decades, historians of women might weigh in on, on these debates about what constitutes a woman, providing new ways to think about the category as other than already known, self-evident, or fixed. The task of rethinking the meaning of woman has never been more urgent. A few weeks ago, an incident widely reported in the international press revealed some of the unhappy epistemological consequences arising from efforts to support gender neutrality. To mark the one year anniversary of the death of the Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, RBG, the American Civil Liberties Union tweeted an iconic statement she'd made during her 1993 Senate confirmation hearings regarding her views on reproductive rights. Where the ACLU ran into trouble was in its well-intentioned, but perhaps misjudged, substitution of the word woman and the pronouns she and her for gender neutral ones. And here I quote that tweet. The decision whether or not to bear a child is central to a person's life, to their well-being and dignity, when the government controls that decision for people, they are being treated as less than a fully adult human responsible for their own choices. An op-ed columnist writing in the New York Times described this gender neutral version of RBG's statement as unintelligible. But what I found particularly striking was the journalist's concluding remark. You can't change the nature of reality through language alone. While words can and do change how we think about the world, historicizing the category of woman underscores the limits of oppositionality. Embracing 
gender neutral or non-binary pronouns reminds us that the binarization of gender and the power relations this binary secures are not natural. Historians of women will be central in thinking hard and imaginatively about the category of woman. I envisage a future in which the next generation plays a key role in shaping public discussions of the biological body and gender identification. New historical trajectories might investigate how cultural shifts in the realm of science and medicine on hormones, chromosomes, genetics, and the psychology of sex contributed to different ways of thinking about gender, complicating and troubling the category of woman. I see historians of woman, women as particularly well positioned to foster fresh understandings of the gender binary, a project that highlights the gains of em embarking with uncertainty about the category. Their task will be to offer nuanced historical explanations of these currently fractious debates about the politics of naming the gendered self. Thank you. Jane Humphreys. I speak as an economic historian and a feminist economist. I hope that in the next 30 years, women's history is brought to bear on the mainstream. Several generations of economic historians have pulled women from the shadows of history. Previously ignored sources and new ways of looking at them, shown the importance of women's contributions to material well-being, social reproduction, and economic growth. Contributions made despite both biological burdens, menstruation, pregnancy, breastfeeding, and coercive cultural constraints, often reinforced by violence. Yet despite the evidence, too often the grand narratives of economic history remain impervious and so misled. Let me illustrate. Mainstream accounts of the standard of living remain focused on the resources that men could accumulate in a market economy on male wages. Yet we know that in most historical settings, women and children contributed either through earnings or subsistence production. We know too that many individuals did not live in families, that many families did not contain adult men, or if they did, those men were often unable or unwilling to work, or reluctant to share wages they considered their own. Lazy assumptions about so-called male breadwinning continue to distort secular accounts of living standards. Distortions proliferate. On the other side of living standards, the cost of living remains based on expenditure patterns that leave children and women's needs to one side, making no allowance, for example, for schooling costs or the payments to nurses and midwives required for the frequent childbearing of these times. Moreover, there is an enormous and enduring omission for the cost of living forgets about the labour involved in turning commodities into livings, making meals out of foodstuffs, creating cleanliness from detergents and clothing from fabrics. Even as markets develop, much of this labour remains unpaid and done by women in the home. Add in caring labour and it is clear there is a mountain of productive activity being ignored. One third to one half of economic activity depending on the time and place. The exclusion of unpaid domestic labor from economic calculation is conceptually indefensible. It makes no sense. As A.C. Pigou noted, if a man married his cook or his housekeeper, although the same services would be delivered, national income would decline. <laughs> Justification relies on specious pragmatism Valuing unpaid domestic labour is too difficult, yet many other services are not that are not monetised are included. Their values imputed from analogous provision within the market. Feminist economists have long demanded that the value of domestic labour be included in national accounts, but it's only hesitantly responded to by governments and the United Nations. 
Excluding unpaid domestic work distorts understanding of the economy. But it also means that the women themselves become invisible, and much of the work they do, whether paid or unpaid, is devalued. Caring labor is a good example. Even well performed as paid work in the capitalist economy, it's trivialized, disrespected, and deemed unskilled. Exposed by the pandemic as vital to our well-being, many people have been shocked at the poverty of pay and conditions in the sector, and perhaps shocked too at the way in which absent market provision, tasks have been redelegated back into the home to be picked up by women with adverse effects on their accumulated experience, pay, and careers. Another telling illustration of the absence of women's history in my mainstream concerns explanations of trends in population. These remain fixated on men's response to economic conditions. Women don't seem to be present during dem demographic transitions. <laughs> Yet recent work has demonstrated that if women can support themselves, they may be less inclined, in fact, downright reluctant, to marry young and bear lots of children. What better rationale for girls' education and women's equal access to labor markets than that they help bring needs in line with resources in our stressed planet? Women's inclusion in mainstream economic history provides a more complete grand narrative but it is also essential for a more correct one. Only then will our historical understanding lead to policies and practices within which we can all live the lives we have reason to value. Thank you. Now, I'm speaking as um, a, a historian whose work intersects with memory. And in the work on memory, the question of voice is incredibly, incredibly important. important. <laughs> <laughs> um, who gets to speak? Whose voices are heard? Whose voices are amplified? Who amplifies them? And more importantly, how? This leads me to the question of the tools we use as historians to make history, to do history. So for many, many years, um, our approach has been through archival material. And I think what we need to think about is decentralizing the, the, the settings and the places of knowledge production by going out in various communities. And I mean all communities. Why am I saying this? because all historians are more or less already doing this work, but I think this is the future for, our, uh, for new generations and for our communities of, of uh, historians. Decentralizing the settings by involving what is something really important in the work on memory, which is kinesthetics. We learn through motions, we learn through movement, we learn through our bodies, and what we learn goes on to the conscious, the unconscious, and the ways in which we transmit it is really depending on the ways in which we have learned this information. So decentralizing means having, actually challenging the ways in which we have been uh, learning. Decentralizing also means that for our young learners, it's a new experience. It can be a few hours, a few days, a few weeks, but it means confronting them and challenging them and urging them to challenge their, um, the way they have been learning so far. It's, it's, it's an incredibly humbling in, uh, experience. It means that they get to see how generations, how communities have been teaching and learning and producing knowledge without having access to what is considered to be archival material as we know them. So it's new ways of creating histories. But it's also an important step because it teaches them that there is such a thing as co-producing knowledge and transmitting knowledge. That's my first point. The second point is to be in tune with our world, whether it's our discipline, our area of research or not. And I'm thinking about environmental question, the climate change. And by the way, I don't know if you know this, but in the 1970s, there was a scientist, a Kenyan born, a woman who actually 
sounded the alarm about the environmental issues. And later on, she went on to, uh, to have to receive the Nobel Prize, and it was Professor Wangari Maathai. In 1977, she did create a, a movement called the Black Belt, uh, the Green Belt Movement. And I don't hear about her at all. So for me, it's very important to remember those histories of liberation, those histories of resilience, and we need to teach them, and we need to be bold and be brave and keep on teaching them, because this is our future, and not ignore those voices. I'm going back to this idea of voice. The, sec the third point I want to make, and it's really about voices, but in different ways. It's, it is about the, um, the amazing ways in which uh, digital humanities has transformed our discipline. We use the tools. It's not necessarily environmentally friendly when you come to think of it, but bear with me. So these, these tools, use, the use of technology to transform our disciplines, and it's incredibly important, but that knowledge is not democratized. Let's think about this. I was born on the edge of the rainforest, the Cameroonian rainforest. I had the opportunity to study, come to Europe, make a living, make a life as a child, and grew up. So each one of you, you have the opportunity to actually do each strand of history that you want to do. You can do indigenous history, you can do African history. You have the technology almost at your fingertips. Think about somebody born on the edge of the rainforest who does not want to do colonial history, who does not want to look into African history, who's interested in, let's say, Irish women in the 20th century, for example, after the First World War. They have no way of doing that kind of history because the kind of archival material at their disposal is always related to their background. So if we want to democratize knowledge, if we want to create global citizens and encourage young, younger generations of, of, of women across the globe, we need to think of ways, practical ways, to, um, to, get them to, have, um, to get them to have access to certain tools and technologies. And that's what I have to say. Thank you. Well, I've wanted to be here for so long because the Sheldonian was the place where women of the town would attend the annual oration up there with the worst view and where the orator would insult them in Latin, which, of course, they couldn't understand in a university where they were not permitted to be students. Now, this same space is being repurposed to celebrate a chair in women's history. Hooray! <laughs> I want to look backwards and then forwards. It's been a long journey. It started with the women at the Women's Liberation Conference here at Ruskin in 1970, and the many feminist groups that met outside of universities and institutions. It would be hard to imagine a more unlikely place to host the first chair of women's history than Oxford. So slow to admit women, so tardy giving them degrees, so reluctant to open its historic colleges to both women and men. So it's wonderful that it's leading on change now. This chair honors Hillary Rodham Clinton, and it's fitting that it's happening during the tenure of the first woman vice chancellor. She made it happen, and it has come out of their friendship. They also had some help. I can't mention everyone here, but I have to thank Michael Cooper and Alida Black, extraordinary people. And 
John Watts and Karen O'Brien for seeing it through. And I would like to thank my co-workers and sisters, Deb Oxley and Ruth Harris, true friends. The three of us have worked together throughout. It takes a village, so Secretary Clinton has said, and in this case, it takes more than a whole town or even a whole country because this is an internationally founded chair. And it really comes from outside this institution as well as inside, and that is important. Women's history began outside institutions, first because women were not allowed to join them, could not learn Latin, and were then excluded because they were thought not good enough scholars. Being outside institutions is painful, and it's good to be brought inside to their center, which is what this permanent chair achieves. But there are strengths, too, that come from being outside, not being part of the establishment. It enables you to ask different questions. It makes you critical. It makes you imagine. My hope for women's history of the future is that it does not forget where it came from, that it does not lose its radical edge, that it listens to those outside institutions and those in the coming generation, that it remain linked to feminism, anti-racism, to LGBT plus issues, to critical voices, to frank and free discussion, and to a powerful vision of what liberation can mean for us all. is being lazy. I'm sure there are questions, so I'd like to see some more. Um, I'm going to ask um, one of my own. It's been touched on, but I'd like the members of the panel to think about it more specifically, and that's how can women's history change debates about public policy and politics? Who would like to start? If you'd like to take an example, um, that would be good, instead of trying to do the whole thing, <laughs> which is impossible. No, yeah. OK. We'll start again. Jane? Um, well, I think I did try and answer this question in my comments, because I, I was particularly, I could only use two illustrations. We only had four minutes. Um, and one of the illustrations you might remember was to do with the fact that women's education and women's access to the labor market then enables women to be independent, to be self-supporting, and that this has then very profound effects on the rest of society, including, of course, making them less <laughs> willing to marry at very young ages and bear lots of children, and that, of course, is a very significant move within um, the demographic sphere that then, in fact, as we know from very many now um, investigations in, in um, the global south, that uh, this will, in fact, be able to um, bring population growth, um, reduce population growth in line with resources. And given our interests mm. on the panel and climatic climate change and, and the need, in fact, to bring resources in line with, with needs. Um, this is a, a, a good illustration of how important um, women's position in society mm -hmm. is in terms of, of um, improving uh, our, our ability to, to con control the climate. Mm -hmm. It's also true, of course, that um, climate change is impacts particularly adversely on, very me on women rather than men in very many parts of the world. Anyone else want to tackle that? Because there are now lots of questions coming in. <laughs> <laughs> no? Uh, 
Um, I would like to ask, I have something very good here, which is how can women's history be more integrated into history courses so it can be learned by all and not relegated to a separate course many will ignore? I think this is a very old question mm -hmm. and it, it, it comes back to what Jane has asked about how can we talk about economic history if all our economic indicators don't, dis, don't include women's work and continue to ignore it. So I, I would hope that somebody on the panel would like to respond to this. Yeah. Brenda, thank you. Uh, well, of course it's very difficult to, to think about because it hasn't happened, although there have <laughs> been some attempts to do so. In my class on um, resources and historiography just last week, we talked about you know, an attempt at the, U at the University of California, Irvine, um, to, to do just this, to have a global history class and to include you know, the study of women within that as the center of what we were looking at. And what the people decided to do, what the, the scholars decided to do in that class was to look at something which, uh, which was important to everyone on the globe, which was you know, the economy, for example, and to talk about where are women's places in the economy um, from, I think, the early, throughout the early modern period. I think what we have to do is really radically rethink uh, the ways in which we approach um, intellectual topics. Um, women, females, girls, we are all um, a part of every aspect of society. And so to think that, you know, the economy, for example, or politics, for example, or, you know, science, for example, or whatever, is really the history, that history really is about men and men's efforts or failings or et cetera. Um, is, is a mistake, it's a horrible uh, mistake. And so we are all you know, called on to really rethink the ways in which we think about what are considered the um, most important aspects of the academy, the most important subjects, the most important topics. Um, and it, you know what, a lot of people resist that. Mm -hmm. But the thing about it is that um, it is an incredibly revolutionary and evolutionary um, process as a scholar, as an academic, to try to think from the other side, mm -hmm. you know, to try to just turn things topsy-turvy to a certain extent um, and, and to move forward with that. And so that's a challenge that we all have to, we have to take up and we have to teach our students to do the same thing. Uh, this shifts the, the narrative just a little bit, but I, I've always been so taken aback by you know, the response that people in the United States had to the New York Times 1619 project, mm. which was actually to center race versus centering males, uh, mostly British males, actually, <laughs> uh, in terms of the founding of the United States or you know, what happens in Virginia in that first century. And it is always a good exercise to, 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 to speak from the other side. It doesn't mean that you're gonna change your conclusions. I think you will, but you don't necessarily have to, but you have to be able to see it from the other side. And we cannot continue to teach any history class as if 50% of the population does not exist. Or, if, you know, 50% of the population only deserves one week of the quarter, <laughs> or um, one class, yeah. or two out of 10 potential research projects. Mm -hmm. We really just have to force ourselves to do it, because none of us have been raised to do that. None of us has been educated, really, to do that. And so we, it's, it's our responsibility, and we can't leave our students in the same shape intellectually that we entered college, okay, mm -hmm. or graduate school, mm -hmm. or left it, you know, so, mm -hmm. thank you. So if we imagine um, what a history curriculum will look like in a decade, 
Um, it could be that uh, historians will investigate masculinity and femininity mm -hmm. together, uh, the gender system together, and that will provide new perspectives on the family, on reproduction, on um, a lot of issues. And it, to me, that would be a success uh, if we think about a decade on or, or further, uh, since we're supposed to be thinking about 30 years. Mm. Um, but I think that uh, a sign of success will be that we've got gender history and, um, you know, right now LGBT history is a course that you can take, but I think we should be studying heterosexuality. We should be looking at a lot of different uh, sexual practices uh, in our history courses. So I think that there's a, a very exciting future ahead by uh, expanding the horizons that way. Yes, I, I was thinking about, you know, the value of thinking outside the box mm -hmm. and sh shifting ourselves and this is, and how difficult it is. And though we all applaud critical thinking, it's actually extremely difficult mm -hmm. to do that. And one of the questions here is, um, how can we resist essentializing womanhood in telling the gendered history of women while doing justice to the commonality of oppression experienced by women? Now, I think that's front-loaded, but I still think it, was, it would be interesting to think about the relationship between unity and diversity in, in terms of women's experience. Would anyone like to speak to that? I'd like to... To, as, as somebody who's working as well on colonial history, mm. um, finding information about women is, is kind of hard, mm -hmm. <laughs> to say the least. And um, I think there are ways to do these things. Again, I'm going back to this idea of voices. And Sheila, Sheila mm. Robertson yeah. actually did something incredible, which you look at the, the kind of social history. And I was thinking about the curriculum all the mm. time, and we're talking, we had this question earlier which is, instead of having women's history or gender history as an option included into, you know, the big survey classes, and I know Oxford has got the history of British Isles. There are ways in which you can inject and make gender and, 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 and women's history part of those histories of the British Isles, and I think sure. it's much more organically, uh, much more organic, I don't know if I like that term, okay. It's organic, and actually, students will be incredibly receptive to that. I agree. Yeah. And on that note, I, oh, Lyndall, please. Yeah. Um, or just to give another example of things that we think that we know all about. I thought that I knew all about Luther and that he had the, Martin Luther, the 16th century German reformer, and that he had very clear ideas about the differences between men and women, and that he just used the ideas at hand on essentializing womanhood, as, as um, that question puts it. He liked to think of women staying at home like snails with their house already on them. <laughs> <laughs> but there is another way of looking at Luther, and recent work about not thinking about gender as a binary category has really made me rethink it. Because perhaps what Luther is doing is reacting with a certain kind of horror to the society he sees around him where he's seeing gender divisions that are not straightforward and clear, where he sees women who are involved and working in the economy, where he sees women who are even trying to have their own voices, who are engaging in revolts, and have things to say politically, and he doesn't like it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's very helpful. Um, it's it, the question keeps on coming up, and it's such an important one that I have to ask it. Do you, how do you think academic institutions such as Oxford can better represent the histories of women in, of color in a more balanced perspective? And of course, this raises the whole question of imperial history, colonial history, the history of the global south, mm -hmm. and the difficulty of sources. So would any of you like to speak to that? Please. Well, I think one of the wonderful things about trying to make certain that a great place like Oxford um, really does teach women's history and does include women's history as part of the curriculum, um, as part of all the classes that are taught, um, is that women's history gives us an opportunity to, in some ways, recreate the ways in which we do history. 
Mm -hmm. So that if we have to make this, this mighty shift, um, and we, we have to, you know, um, the ways in which we learn to do that, it, there are also ways in which we can, from, the, you know, from the, our starting point where we are now, be more inclusive. That is, not allow women's history to continue to be um, an intellectual site of exclusion of marginality for, you know, women who are not middle class white women, for example. And so um, I think that that is one of the opportunities that we have when we look forward to women's history in 30 years is actually stopping at this moment and saying we have to be the site, we have to be the intellectual site where these typical margins of you know, race and class and um, generation and location and, you know, all of that is dealt with. Um, and women's historians have been trying to do that, and we haven't mm -hmm. succeeded, <laughs> you know. We have not succeeded, um, but we realize that it is problematic in the historiographies that we have created. Um, we have been talking about it and working on you know, the archival problems, um, trying to, the inclusivity problem. And that inclusivity is not just in terms of topical, but also the people who do it, um, and also the kinds of sources that we use. And so I think we should think of it as a, as a great opportunity um, at this moment as we recommit ourselves to women's history at a place like Oxford. Um, for example, to tackle the problem of inclusion, to write and to teach, um, and to, you know, present women's history in a way um, that it will help to heal and to um, to heal history, the practice of history in general. Thank you. Um, this is my, I think, the last question, and it's mm -hmm. one that directly impinges on Brenda's answer. And it's a, a difficult one for us because we're professional historians, and that is, how do we ensure women with vital lived experience but without access to elite education who are able to share their voice in designing the women's history agenda? Mm, that's a great question. And it's a great question. Yeah. yeah. I think I, I tackled that a bit when I talked about the, yes. the idea of de decentralizing the <clears throat> centers of knowledge, mm. decentralizing the tools, and rethinking cool production of knowledge, I think. Yes. Um, yeah. Would anyone like to elaborate a bit more on how that could be done, other than... Well, yeah. we have to support public history. You know, we, we have yes. to support public history. Um, have to, you know, work with teachers in schools um, who are teaching young children to think about how important their voice is, whether they're male, female, or another gender, um, that everyone's voice is important, that everyone's voice is, uh, you know, has to be heard, should be archived to a certain extent. And, you know, supporting public history, supporting, you know, art projects that indeed reach a large audience. Um, supporting uh, museums, supporting um, media projects uh, that get to larger communities and that kind of thing, supporting libraries. I mean, these are all the mm -hmm. kinds of things that we should be doing as professional historians mm -hmm. to make certain that history is not just located, you know, in a place like Oxford, but that it's located in the schools, it's located in the local libraries and, and in, you know, um, community, um, you know, community resources like recreational centers, et cetera. So I think, you know, it is, it is part of what we owe to society. Uh, we have this magnificent privileged lives um, as scholars at places like this, but what we owe to society, not only is the knowledge that we create, but also you know, making certain that the society gets that knowledge, that we work with the public in um, delivering that knowledge and then learning back from them as well. Mm -hmm. Would anyone 
like to add to that, or is yeah. that, I think, oh Can yes, I just add something? It has nothing to do with it. Um, I'm excited. <laughs> I've, been, I've been bouncing in my chair when I learned that Brenda uh, Professor Simpson was, uh, was coming. As um, a vice president of the, the Royal Historic Society, I want to, to say that, uh, welcome, first of all. Thank and you. And uh, the, the other thing that is important to say is that I was the first black woman his, um, professor of history in the country, in the United Kingdom. Brenda is the third one. I'd like to ask you to have another round of applause for this remarkable panel. Well, I think the panel has made clear just how much is possible for the future of women's history here. We have a long way to go, but with intellects and commitment like that, it's going to be a fabulous future. Um, so thank you again to our panelists. I I've always said that I look forward to the day when our daughters are not the first female anything. Thanks to Hillary Rodham Clinton, the number of roles for which a woman will be the first is very significantly reduced. <laughs> Among her catalogues of firsts, she was the first woman to win the popular vote in, the US, in a US presidential election. <laughs> Nine years earlier, she was the first woman to win a presidential primary or caucus. She is the first first lady to have been elected to the Senate, the first first lady to have served in the cabinet, the first woman to be elected to statewide office in New York. She was the first female partner in the Rose Law Firm. She was the first student to speak at a Wellesley commencement. Throughout her long, varied, and distinguished career, she has also authored 10 books, she has been a tenacious advocate for the rights of women and children. Her energy, her resilience, and her command of policy are legendary. When Hillary Clinton took it to Twitter some years ago, she described herself in the following terms. Wife, mom, lawyer, woman and kids advocate, Floor, which is First Lady of Arkansas, Flotus, First Lady of the US, US Senator, Secretary of State, author, dog owner, hair icon, <laughs> pantsuit aficionado, glass ceiling cracker. She surprised many by her mastery of the medium, but surprising skeptics by her mastery of policy is one of the hallmarks of her career. As a young lawyer, she was twice named by the National Law Journal as one of the 100 most influential lawyers in America. Elected and re-elected to the Senate, she surprised those anticipating a carpetbagger by her understanding of the issues facing New York, her pragmatism in forging solutions to their problems, and her skill in securing federal support for New York after 9-11. She served on several key committees, armed services, health, education, and labor, environment and public works, and the Select Committee on Aging. As Secretary of State, she was indefatigable, Visiting 112 countries, we have a lot of damage to repair, she explained. Her unglamorous but practical campaign to replace toxic fires with clean cookstoves will reduce carbon while saving lives. 
Through a smart power approach to foreign policy, she sought to supplement reliance on military strength with reliance on America's economic and technological strengths, development, and human rights advocacy. In 2016, she was widely seen to be the most qualified candidate ever to stand to run for the US presidency, running against the least qualified candidate ever to stand. <laughs> In 2008, she famously said, life is too short, time is too precious, and the stakes are too high to dwell on what might have been. We have to work together for what still can be done. In recent years, I have to say that some of us have found it very, very difficult not to think of what might have been. Hillary Clinton is a trailblazer. Her tenacity and skill in advancing the cause of women and children everywhere and forging ever onward has inspired girls, women, and men across the globe and has eased the path for the women who will try to follow her lead. In thinking about a name to associate with Oxford's first chair in women's history, hers was our first choice, and we were thrilled when she accepted. So please join me in welcoming Secretary Hillary Rodham Clinton. <laughs> very, very much, and thank you, Vice Chancellor, for that warm introduction. Chancellor Patton, thank you for being here. Thanks to the extraordinary panel, who I think have laid out quite an ambitious and challenging agenda for all of us. Um, I am delighted that they did so. I had told um, some of those who are on the panel, along with the Vice Chancellor, that I really thought all I needed to do once I stood up here was to literally just let out a cheer. And so let's let out a cheer for the first chair in women's history in the entire world here at... As you've already heard, uh, this is a milestone celebration for Oxford, but indeed it is for so many around the world who look and see what is being inaugurated here today. As Professor Lyndall Roper was saying, think of those first women who snuck into the Sheldonian. It was sometime after 1669 when the construction was finally completed, and they wanted to listen, they wanted to see the debate, and all the scholars arrayed were obviously men, um, but they were anxious to somehow participate. And think of how those few women who dared sneak inside to hear what was going on in this place, who would have been hidden in the back at the top in accordance with gender norms and protected by shadows were still suffering contempt and enduring mockery for their daring to have entered this hallowed place. When you think back to what it must have been like for women coming in over so many years it is gratifying, but also frustrating, isn't it, to think of how long it has taken. You know, finally in the 1870s, women's colleges came to Oxford, followed in 1880 by Oxford, finally, finally opening its doors to women, but with a catch, as the vice chancellor reminded us. We could study here, we could become experts in our fields. We could even take final examinations, but we could not obtain the degrees that our male peers received for the same work. And then finally in 1920, that changed. 
women were awarded the degrees that we had earned, standing as academic equals to the men they had studied alongside. Those first women set the foundation for a century of progress. In 1957, restrictions limiting the number of women undergraduates were finally eliminated. And then in 1963, women were admitted to the Oxford Union Society, an important ground for aspiring politicians. Uh, Sherwell announced the news by calling it a vote for sanity. In 1974, the first male colleges began to admit women, and five years later, the first women's colleges began to admit men. Starting in the 1960s, feminist thinkers like Sheila Robotham and Sally Alexander and Anna Devine and others founded the History Workshop, a movement associated with Ruskin College where in 1970, the first Women's Liberation Conference was held and Professor Robotham is here with us today. And in 2016, Vice Chancellor Richardson broke the 900-year streak of male leaders of Oxford by becoming the first woman vice chancellor. So, we can recite this history, and we obviously know that Oxford women have proved their mettle in so many ways. Um, yes, they've become prime ministers, they have uh, won Nobel Prizes, we even have a U.S. Supreme Court Justice uh, with a degree from Oxford. It won't be hard to guess which one that might be, and so much more. Proving that, yes, progress is possible, but the history of these gutsy and notable women whose names and achievements we know is the bare minimum of understanding women's lives and stories. And so now we have the next chapter. 101 years after women first matriculated at Oxford, the Sheldonian is filled with women and men of all ages, nationalities, races, religions, with different experiences and expertise all here to celebrate the chair in women's history and what it represents. This chair will be perpetual, lasting as long as Oxford does. It is a testament to our complicated past, our challenging present, and the unlimited future that we strive to realize. And it says not only to the world of academia that women's history is worthy of study, but that women's lives and thoughts have always mattered. That history includes not just the notable, but also the marginalized and forgotten. And that no one can ever again write us out of history. So while this is the first chair in women's history in the world, it certainly, I hope, will not be the last. And I want to acknowledge the people who truly made this chair possible. First, my deepest gratitude to Vice Chancellor Louise Richardson, a scholar and visionary leader who, along with the university's administration, made this chair happen in record time. Second, to the donors who supported this dream, please know that your generosity in funding the chair will help teach us so much more about ourselves and continue the march toward global gender equality. But we would not be here without the collective determination of Professors Lyndall Roper, Ruth Harris, Deb Oxley, and Alita Black, the Minervas. They envisioned this chair, they understood what it would mean not only to students and colleagues at Oxford, 
but also to those at universities around the world. And their organizational and persuasive wizardry was unstoppable. And finally, I am thrilled, thrilled to thank the inaugural chair, Professor Brenda Stevenson. Chosen after a global search, she left UCLA to accept this challenge. And in her brilliant lecture last night, she reminded us that women often tell women's stories. Her insights into 1990s Los Angeles are as piercing as her studies of the antebellum and Jim Crow American South or global slavery. And each piece of her scholarship places women, particularly women of color, at the center. Now, even after all of this, some may wonder, I can hear them tapping away on their phones right now <laughs> to enter a debate on social media. Why is women's history essential? Why this chair? Why now? And I have to tell you, I look forward to joining that debate. <laughs> well, the easy answer is that we're half the population and responsible for birthing and raising the rest. <laughs> Yet even that essential role hasn't received the respect and attention it merits but obviously, our history includes far more than that. Women's history is the story of how half of society struggles to make a living and a life, how families and societies are organized, how economies and governments function. It is the story of our struggle for self-determination, our fight for equal rights, our demand that women's rights are human rights, our quest not only for political and civil rights, but the power to claim and enforce them. Women's history is the greatest shift in historical explanation since the Second World War, when an intellectual movement to challenge the orthodoxy governing women's lives transformed our views of the past. Now, I've spent many years working to expand rights and opportunities for women. But as we all know, barriers persist. If we're ever going to understand and overcome those barriers, the lens through which we investigate the lives of women of all races, nationalities, and backgrounds must be widened. That is the perspective women's history provides. Not only does it redefine and challenge the history we take for granted, but it teaches us how societies and cultures around the world developed, who amassed power and how it was wielded, and the impact of those decisions on women's lives. Simply put, a fuller understanding of and appreciation for women's history is imperative to advancing human knowledge and equality. We cannot attain sustainable, effective power over our lives without understanding our history. Let me give you a recent example. Last month, I had the honor of conferring honorary degrees at Queen's University Belfast to a group of women who formed their own political party in the 1990s in order to participate in Northern Ireland's peace negotiations. They were instrumental in developing the Good Friday Agreement, which ended three decades of violent conflict. But as former MP Bernadette Devlin Michalski says, their role remains largely invisible not because women get written out of history, but because they never get written in it. 
This chair is part of a bulwark against that omission. It exists to study, to investigate, to question, and to contribute to a history that reflects the lives of women as well as men. It has taken a very long time for history to care about, let alone include, the stories of people of all races, classes, identities, religions, and abilities across centuries and around the globe. This chair underscores the indisputable fact that women are critical to understanding our past, whether they be peasants or queens, rebels or prime ministers, educated or illiterate, domestic workers or Nobel laureates. And in scrutinizing how and why women are excluded from history, we interrogate and redefine our notions of power. You may have heard the famous phrase, history is written by the victor. Well, that's true. And it's what women's history works against. It centers and uplifts voices that haven't been heard before. Those of women, people of color, LGBTQ people, in doing so, it reveals a more accurate, fuller history that shapes how we see the world today. In a way, women's history is what history has not been, a fuller, accurate account of our successes, our failures, our darkest past, our greatest accomplishments, and lessons that should have been learned already. I'm reminded of another Oxford graduate who showed that women's history is about power. The gifted historian Florence Mahoney, who graduated from Oxford in 1952 and went on to become the first Gambian woman to obtain a PhD. Much of her work is dedicated to challenging a once commonly accepted assumption that Africa's only history was that of its European colonizers. The rest was darkness, she was told, and darkness is not a subject of history, a debatable point. Dr. Mahoney didn't accept that. She helped set up Gambia's first national archives, promoted the study of African history in Europe, and ensured that women were prominent in Gambia's National Museum. She made the promotion of marginalized voices a practice, not just a theory. And that is what Professor Stevenson and so many of you gathered here tonight are committed to doing in your studies. And it's what all who hold the chair will pursue as well. I like to imagine how under the chair's leadership generations of women's history students, history students in general, will be more confident, more curious, questioning, challenging, confronting old ideas as well as new ones. And armed with the courage of those who came before, they will battle old biases, discriminatory laws, the systems that prevent women and therefore all of us from claiming our place and our power. It's a powerful vision, and I believe there is no better place for it to happen than here at Oxford. My family and I have long been connected to the Oxford community. On my first trip to the campus, when I had just graduated from law school, my then boyfriend, Bill Clinton, took me <laughs> to revisit his haunts. We went to University College. Uh, it was wonderful. We visited a lot of other places that were interesting. Um, <laughs> but it was a walk down memory lane for him and an immediate feeling of attraction for me. And then in 2014, I sat here as a proud parent as Chelsea received her PhD in international relations. The entire ceremony was in Latin, which I thought was incredibly exciting. <laughs> and 
and having taken three years of Latin, I was sending a little prayer to Miss Fisher and Miss Snyder, who had been my teachers, whenever I could recognize a word. <laughs> I returned in 2018 as the Romanist lecturer and to unveil a statue of one of my heroes uh, and an icon of women's history, Eleanor Roosevelt, in front of the Bonavero Institute of Human Rights in Mansfield College. And I had a great time joining a virtual panel this year honoring Professor Stevenson. And last month, I returned to the Sheldonian to receive an honorary doctorate in civil law, once again, entirely in Latin. <laughs> and the university orator stood up there and delivered this spirited, dynamic address, all in Latin. I couldn't recognize a single word that time, <laughs> but I assumed that there were no insults coming at the women, <laughs> that if there were insults, they were equal opportunity insults. <laughs> but beyond the wonderful memories I have here, when we were envisioning this chair, I thought Oxford was the right place because this university has been on the cutting edge of scholarship for a millennium. Fittingly, it is also home to one of the most esteemed history departments in the world, which will now be expanded to include women's history and the history of others uh, as part of the curriculum. And what is happening here at Oxford reverberates throughout higher learning. So by establishing the chair here, we're signaling that the study of women's history should be a priority at every university. So it is my hope. <laughs> that other universities follow Oxford's lead uh, because this work could not be more timely or urgent. A quarter century ago, when I declared in Beijing that human rights are women's rights and women's rights are human rights once and for all, it was viewed as a controversial statement. Now, thankfully, it's a feminist rallying cry. I'm delighted by this, but the most transformative moment of the conference was not my speech. It was the adoption of the platform for action, whereby representatives from all 189 nations participating committed to the, quote, full and equal participation of women in political, civil, economic, social and cultural life, unquote. Now in many ways, women and girls across the globe are better off than we were 25 years ago. A girl born 25 years ago in many places could not own property or sign a contract. Today she can. In East Africa, for example, a girl born 25 years ago grew up in a region where female genital cutting was widespread. Now the practice has declined, not disappeared, but declined. In 1995, domestic violence was a crime in just 13 countries. Today, it is illegal in more than 100. And we've nearly closed the global gender gap in primary school enrollment and maternal mortality has dropped by more than half. But the work is nowhere near done. Simply embracing the concept of women's rights, let alone enshrining them in laws and constitutions, is not the same as achieving full equality. Rights are critically important, but they are nothing without the power to claim them. Cambridge University professor Mary Beard dedicated an entire book to this subject. In Women and Power, a Manifesto, she explores the misogyny that has shaped our world for centuries and urges readers to reject the notion of power as a zero-sum game. If power is seen as a tool only a few people can wield at a time within systems designed by and for men, an entire gender will forever be excluded from it. 
Instead, she suggests, why not look at power more comprehensively? We should think of it as the ability to be effective, to make a difference in the world and the right to be taken seriously. We are in the midst of a global struggle between these ideals and a rising tide of authoritarianism, which has unsurprisingly coincided with a crackdown on women's rights. Fundamental human rights, civic virtue, even facts and reason are under assault. In Afghanistan, we've seen just how eager the Taliban is to repress women and girls and reverse the gains they've worked so hard to achieve in the last 20 years. They replaced the Women's Affairs Ministry with virtue authorities. They have not allowed girls to return to schools or universities and are targeting female judges, lawyers, athletes, and educators, really any woman who helped build or lead their country. In Turkey, President Erdogan removed his country from the Istanbul Convention, a global agreement to fight violence against women. Poland has signaled its intention to withdraw, and Hungary refuses to ratify the treaty. In Texas, the legislature has essentially outlawed abortion and created a vigilante system to enforce the prohibition by offering $10,000 bounties to anyone who reports a woman, her doctor, or anyone else who the vigilante believes is breaking the law. They have set up in Texas their own dangerous virtue authorities. And the pandemic has exacerbated the economic and social inequities women face. In my country, frontline essential workers are predominantly women. Healthcare workers are largely women. People who have been laid off or lost their jobs are disproportionately women. Women are facing really hard choices about going back to work, if they even can, because of a lack of children childcare options. This is unraveling decades of hard-won progress toward achieving gender equality in the workforce. The United Nations estimates that 13 million children will be forced into marriages in the next decade as a result of the pandemic. 20 million girls will not return to school. As we locked down at home to prevent the spread of the virus, a shadow pandemic emerged of increased violence in the home against women and girls. In 2020 alone, women around the world lost more than 64 million jobs, costing them at least $800 billion in earnings. That's more than the combined GDP of 98 countries which is why the World Economic Forum now predicts it will take over 135 years to reach gender equality in the economy. That's an increase of about 100 years from before the virus hit. Now, I was clear-eyed about the difficulty of making progress 25 years ago in Beijing and in the years since, that's why, as Secretary of State, I insisted that the rights and needs of women and girls must be a pillar of U.S. development and diplomacy. Because, guess what? Women's interests are national security interests. And it's why I instructed my team to craft the first U.S. national action plan on women, peace, and security. And I chaired the U.N. Security Council session that adopted Resolution 1888 to combat rape as a tool of war. But even being clear-eyed, still I am surprised by the backlashes provoked by women's advancement. It turns out, as useful as the internet has been to feminist organizing, it's also created a platform 
for misogynists to spread sexist vitriol and disinformation. Young girls and women are assaulted by false and confusing messages. They're not thin enough, beautiful enough, good enough, resulting in increased rates of anxiety, depression, and eating disorders. Again and again, we've seen anger, hostility, sexism directed at women who have the audacity to seek power from in their home to the White House. Yet even in the midst of all this turmoil, I still believe the unfinished business of the 21st century is the full equality of women. There are too few women in the upper reaches of the private sector, academia, science, technology, politics, and government. And we've all heard the saying, you can't be what you can't see. So each of us should take it upon ourselves to do what we can to help more women and girls see themselves in any field and at the highest reaches. This chair will help us counter the faults incomplete narratives that often govern our culture. It will help us understand the thoughtful, persistent work we must undertake to build a more just world. When women are not written into the history books, their hard work, their courage, their lives, their legacies are forgotten, making it that much easier to dismiss women's rights and efforts today. But to study and share women's contributions, this chair will need your support. It will need the Oxford community. The students, faculty, and staff have already been enthusiastic about establishing the chair. You embraced it. You competed to host it. And St. John's College will be hosting it. And here we are celebrating its inauguration. I hope this university-wide bond continues and that you continue to learn from and be inspired by Professor Stevenson and all those who will hold the chair following her. I also hope researchers, advocates, and activists around the world look to this chair at Oxford as a model of intellectual rigor, mentorship, and teaching, which will lead other universities to see it as a model to base their own rigorous woman-centered scholarship on. We frankly need more chairs in women's history so that we can create this incredible movement that will not only inculcate ideas into history, but into society. You know, when we first began discussing this chair a few years ago, I was in the midst of thinking uh, deeply about my own experiences running for president. In fact, I wrote a whole book about it. <laughs> wrote a whole chapter about women in politics. Because as a candidate, I felt the full force of misogyny. From the blunt sexism of my opponent to the trap of likability, which seems to snare only women. Watching the diverse slate of 2020 presidential candidates was inspiring, but also discouraging to hear the same familiar tropes about women candidates, speaking styles, voices, authenticity. I have known and keep learning that we need a deeper understanding if we're ever to be honest about the biases and the cultural norms that subordinate women, even women in very high profile positions. So 101 years after the first women scholars received their degrees in this hallowed theater, in Latin, <laughs> we're still fighting some of the same battles they faced. The tactics may have changed, but the strategy is still the same silence and suppress women. Tonight, we inaugurate this first chair in women's history to inspire students and scholarship to help us overcome these barriers. I so wish the women who first dared to enter the Sheldonian four and 450 years ago 
could be here with us in this hall tonight. I wish they could have heard the lecture that Professor Stevenson delivered last night and the panel that we just heard from. I wish they knew the clarion call Professor Stevenson has given us to dedicate ourselves to give voice to those women and girls across time and place to ensure that they are not silenced and distorted by history. This is what we are called to do today. This is the work of this chair, to study and understand the lives of those women and the centuries of women who came before and after them, to write them into history, and in doing so, to ensure that we are building a future where everyone has the opportunity and the power to pursue their own God-given potential. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Secretary Clinton. We could not have hoped for a more wonderful launch for this chair. That was an inspirational speech, a powerful speech, and one I think we will all remember, as we will this wonderful panel uh, that preceded it. So now I think it's up to all of us, everyone in this building, to ensure that women and other marginalized groups are never again erased from history. When our great-granddaughters convene back here in the Sheldonian, probably in Latin, to celebrate, <laughs> to celebrate the bicentenary of the admission of women to Oxford and the centenary of the Hillary Rodham Clinton Chair in Women's History, let's ensure that they look back on us with great pride in what we have accomplished. Thank you all for joining us this evening.